how important is it? Let's open with a question. How important is for us to understand, if we possibly can, what it means to consider Jesus as our king? Uh, and we don't really use words, you know, a word like that in our society. Now they do in other countries and other places, but uh, Jesus is our king. How really uh, valuable, how, how important is that? The words king and kingdom as referring to Jesus are so numerous in our holy Bibles that I lost count. There's just so many times that, that Jesus is referred to as king, and, and this experience is referred to as a kingdom. It, with such a magnitude of references then, uh, it's apparent that we have to be aware, we have to dig into that, be aware of the value of Jesus being our king, the king. Uh, what a concept. Let's be clear that we as Americans do not really have a daily living pragmatic knowledge of kings and kingdoms we just don't now we have people who want to be the king you know who want to establish kingdoms we have that you know we have uh, well anyway but jesus is really our first exposure to actually living under the rule of a king we are accustomed to what we call a democratic government which that's kind of a falsehood. It's really just a pseudonym because we're not really... But anyway, uh, why is all everything leading to that? I don't know because I'm, we're exposed to all this right now, I guess. But that's just a pseudonym. Democratic, you know, uh, most of us are not familiar with actually living uh, uh, in a kingdom with a king as our ruler. With the buck actually does stop here. It really does. We're, we're not used to that. As born again from above believers, children of God, Jesus is our divine sovereign. Jesus is our supreme ruler. Jesus is. He is the maximum. The buck does stop here. He is the best, the absolute, the utmost, without equal. There is no higher authority. Jesus is king. Wow, wow. Ephesians 1, 17 through 23. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set apart ones. And so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named above every title that can even be conferred not only in this age but in this world uh, and also in the age in the world which are to come and he has put all things under his feet and has appointed him the universal supreme head of the church a headship exercised throughout the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all for in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. Amen, Amen to the word of God. That's just a whole message just right there, just by itself, uh, a whole message. God is true to his promise of a king of a king, true to his intent that the king over humankind should be and will be himself. Himself. God had promised David a long, long time ago that his seed would establish the kingdom. And you can read about that in 2 Samuel 7, 12. Jesus Christ is the seed of David, the coming king sent by God as God to restore God's kingship over humankind. Matthew 1, 1, Acts Oh gosh, 1 or 13, 23, Romans 1, 3 through 4, Revelation 22, 16, all of these things, all these scriptures go on and on and on to confirm. 
But even with an inexhaustible list, which we really do have in Scripture, even with an inexhaustible list, no matter what, this is always an issue of trust. Always an issue of trust. Do you trust me? That's what God asks me that all the time. In my heart and in my mind and circumstances I'm faced with, do you trust me? Really, do you trust me? And it's almost as if he says sometimes, well, let's just see. You know, because you talk a good game, boy, let's just see, you know. Do you trust? And it's always an issue of trust. It really is. How much do we trust? How much do I trust? Do you trust Jesus as the sovereign that he is, as our king, as our ultimate and supreme authority, ruler, and provider? The fact is, Jesus is the spiritual king of God's spiritual kingdom among all human beings. And we talk about this all the time. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, whether they want to or not. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. So that's over all human beings. In John 19, 30, Jesus exclaimed from the cross, it is finished, accomplished, completed, brought to fruition. I have established my kingdom. By dying, Jesus won the battle, the spiritual battle, with Satan. He is the theocratic king, the divine king. He's conquered sin. He's conquered death. He's conquered Satan. And he has established his spiritual kingdom. It's already done. It is finished. The cross is his victorious battle. The resurrection is his coronation. Pentecost was the inauguration of a brand new kingdom. In the first sermon uh, for the church <laughs> and to the church and of the church on the day of Pentecost, Peter declared in Acts 2.30 that David had prophesied of this seed, of his seed, seated upon a throne. And that by the resurrection of Jesus Christ then, God had done just that. He had seated the king on the throne. He raised up Jesus to be Lord and to be king. It's a concept that's, that you have to really look at to grab because we don't live that way. We don't have that, that type of experience most of the time. So since the kingdom of God, which is made available in Jesus Christ, is present, it's present, it's universal, uh, it's, it's also spiritual and eternal. It is an eternal kingdom. And since the primary scriptural meaning of the word kingdom is not realm, it's not territory, okay, the, the primary meaning of kingdom when Jesus speaks about it is reign, R-E-I-G-N, reign, rule, and authority. Who's got the power? That, then we have to understand this is not a physical residential kingdom with a specific and limited location because the rule of, and reign of Jesus Christ cannot be accordingly limited, he created everything. He sustains everything. How are you going to limit that? Amen. What did God say? The earth is my footstool. You can't limit it. So it's not limited to some geography, at least not yet. Not yet. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. I know we watch a lot of sci-fi and we think everything's going to be destroyed and burned up and that's the end of it. No. No, it's going to be a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. And there will be some geography to what I'm talking about. But right now, this is not a natural kingdom. This is a spiritual kingdom. It's the lordship of Jesus Christ in the hearts of his people. That's the kingdom. His authority guiding and directing our lives each and every day of our lives. Not just on Sundays. Not just when we get together in a home group. Not just GYB or the women's group. But each and every day of our lives, him guiding and directing us. Given that this is true, then really, why is trust such an issue for us? And it is. Why is that confidence and faith should be strengthened and substantiated by the fact that we serve the king of kings whose kingdom is us? We're the kingdom. We are. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's us. That's where the king lives. That's where the king rules. That's where he reigns. That's where his authority is. You are the kingdom of heaven. So what's the deal with not trusting? Uh, we have to re-examine our position. We make life so difficult. We make it so difficult. But our king has already taken the necessary steps to simplify our lives for it. 
Are, are you struggling through life? And that, boy, that's a loaded question, isn't it? I mean, every day. Are you struggling through life? Who's going to say, oh, no, I'm fine. Well, what drugs are you on? <laughs> you know, everybody has a struggle. Everybody has problems. So you, when you ask that, are you struggling through life? Whatever situation you are going through as God's kingdom, as being born again from above, stop and take notice. You are the kingdom for a king whose speciality happens to be whatever your problem is whose speciality happens to be his kingdom, you. You. Wow. That just smacks me right in the face. And that's, sometimes that's the old Aqua Velva commercial. They smack you. Thanks, I needed that. You know. <laughs> we, should be, we should not only believe this, but say it and sing it like we did this morning. Sing it out loud. Say it out loud. Express it. Jesus, you are God king. I serve a king. This type of expression is what is called our sacrifice of praise. I really do believe that. Watch this sacrifice. Because I know our, our nature. You know your nature. You're not going to let anybody be king. If anybody's going to be king, it's going to be me. Our society teaches us that. I am king of my castle. No, you're not. Your wife is. Shut up. <laughs> See, we're tricked from the very beginning. You know, we're believing the lie from the very beginning. <laughs> but you know, you know what I'm saying? That battle, that battle, it is, it's a sacrifice of praise to bow down and admit, Jesus, you are king. That's an expression of sacrifice of praise. And I really do perceive that comprehending Jesus as the king that he is facilitates a greater capability to accomplish praise. It's easy to praise someone who you really know is king, who you really know is your provider, who gives you each and everything that you have in your life, who gives you permission to get out of bed and take a breath in the morning. It's easy to praise that. But you have to realize that and think about that every single day of, your life, uh, of our lives on this planet. So singing or saying out loud, Jesus, you are king, serves multiple, multiple purposes. There are so many components to this. Two of those components are the applications of keeping him in our thoughts where he's supposed to be. He's not one of us. I know he became one of us, but that's so that we be could become like him, not so he could become like us. He became one of us so we could become like him. And that, it's difficult for us, but if we will realize he's king, it keeps our focus on who he really is and who we really are and who we're supposed to be dependent upon the king. Totally dependent. This is a, a situation where you want to be codependent. You want to be dependent. It really is. This is part of the many, many magnificent results of praise. When you speak things such as, Jesus, you're my king, and I praise you, and I thank you. There's a benefit to that. Hebrews 13, 5, through him, let us therefore, let us constantly and at all times offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, which is the fruit of the lips that thankfully acknowledge and confess and glorify his name. Verbal expression of some kind, speaking or singing or shouting or whispering, audible verbal expression, the fruit of our lips is what Scripture describes. Audible expression, noticeably communicating his name and the characteristics of his name. Praise affects our personal life. When you realize and say from your heart, Jesus, you're my king, that affects your life. To sacrifice means to surrender. It means to give up. It means to offer something of value that we would rather hold on to. What is it in our lives that we always try to hold on to? What we or what we perceive we try to hold on to? It's control. Most of us, not all of us, but well, in this room, all of us. <laughs> control. That's, that's what we try to hold on to. By admitting and saying, Jesus, you are king, we're admitting we are not in control. We don't have it covered. He does. And it benefits us. We give up. Listen, our praise is most valuable to the Lord for several reasons. One, one Scripture tells you it's a sweet-smelling aroma to Him, obviously, but no gift is greater than that of worship from the lips of His children because it benefits the children. If you think about this, it benefits us. He does not need our praise. 
We need our praise. We need it. It opens up doors. Our king is perfect in every way. Our king, your king, he's perfect in every way. He is perfectly holy. He's perfectly exalted. He's perfectly perfect in every way possible. He knows who he is. He does not need our praise. We need it. We need to praise him. To withhold praise, to withhold an expression of Jesus, you're my king, uh, is, is not letting go. And it renders absolutely nothing valuable in your life. It is in the letting go that reaps great benefits for us and to us. That's why it's a sweet aroma to God. It's a sweet aroma because prayer keeps us connected to the king. It keeps us before his throne, his throne of Grace, which we talk about all the time. Grace. John 7, 38. He who believes in me. That's right, sister. Amen. He who believes in me, who cleaves to me, and trusts in and relies on me, as Scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow continuously, continuously, springs and rivers of living water. Now, this, this is something I hope we can grab a hold of because I'm reminded of this a lot from the Holy Spirit. The person who believes, the person who cleaves to, trusts in and relies on, the person who stays connected to the king through him, that person will experience living water flowing from the inside out constantly. That's what, that's what scripture, I mean, it's pretty concise. It's pretty clear. It seems to me then from scriptural evidence and practical life experience, it seems to me that the guideline of present tense continually being filled with the Holy Spirit, as in Ephesians 5.18, is for the purpose of present tense continually being emptied. Being empty. You are continually being filled so that you continually be emptied. We are filled to be emptied so that we can be filled again. A perpetual flow of living water. Living water doesn't sit stagnant, doesn't fill up a container and just sit there and you're just filled. So what? What happens to it? It gets stagnant and stinks and it doesn't serve any purpose. Living water flows. You're emptied and filled back up again. This change, what happens to us as we mature, the change happens from the fact that our capacity gets changed. We, we get stretched and we get pushed and pulled and, and, and sometimes hurt. But when we do, our capacity changes and we get more of the Holy Spirit. Why? So more that can flow out. A greater quantity can come in. A greater quantity can go out. Even though we are to be filled, Jesus did not say, he didn't even allude to this, that whoever stays connected to him, as scripture indicates in the words in him and through him, you've read that, Jesus did not say that the person who stays connected to him will only apprehend the blessing of being filled. How selfish is that? Well, I'm, fill, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And... And what happens next? Jesus said that everything you receive in this as his kingdom, everything you receive should escape out of you and flow out of you. That's how it, it remains living water. It escapes out of you. The teaching of our king is selflessness anti-self-realization. His purpose is not my my personal enhancement. That's not the purpose of our king. Yes, you will be personally enhanced, but that's not his purpose. His purpose is to make me exactly like him, is to make you exactly like him. And in case you haven't noticed, the distinguishing feature of our king is self-expenditure. Everything he was given, he gave out. And that's that's hard. That's very hard. We want to keep it. I'm, I'm keep that mine, mine. You know, it starts at two years old. Or the, what are those uh, seagulls? Mine, 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 mine. You know, we want to keep it, but that's not why we're giving it. We are filled. We are given so that it can be given out. His purpose is to make us like Him in this kingdom. In this kingdom. You can pat yourself when you say that. In this kingdom, we do not increase until we decrease. That's backwards from what we're taught. 
We don't increase until we decrease. We do not gain until we lose. We do not receive until we give. It's what he pours through us that matters. It's what flows out of us that counts. This is why we must publicly and audibly offer praise to our God, to our King, the fruit of our lips that thankfully acknowledge and confess and glorify his name. This is why we should declare, Jesus, you are my King. Oswald Chambers puts it this way. It is not that God makes us beautifully rounded grapes, but that he squeezes the sweetness out of us. Come on, everybody in here should be saying amen. amen. That's what he does. Why? To, because it serves a purpose. It's, it helps somebody. We, we always want it to be about us, you know. Yeah, well, who used to sing that? It's all about me. You know, it's no, 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 no. He squeezes the sweetness out of us. Sometimes he stomps on it. You know, you've seen how they do grapes sometimes. Spiritually, our king does not measure our life by what we deem as circumstantial success. He does, it just, it's not the way he measures things. He measures things by the cross. He measures our fruitfulness by what flows through us, what flows out of us. Consequently, our thinking is time and time again challenged by our king. Uh, always back up, back up and rethink that. Back up and reexamine that. The kingdom of God at this time is not a utopia. It's a spiritual reality with continued physical hindrances here on this earth uh, until consummated in the heavenly realm and the heavenly continuation and reestablished. Why would we think it's any other way? Why would we think it's any other way at all? His kingdom, his reign, and his rule and lordship is spiritual first with the physical or material being secondary. Matthew 6.33 is perfect evidence of that. We tend to live the opposite way, physical first and then spiritual. That's how we go through life. And that's why we go through some of the hard times we do and, and we experience things the way we do. We, if we live totally according to kingdom principles, would we even consider giving the circumstances of our life the power that we give them? And we do. We, we let our circumstances affect our emotions even, how we feel. We're happy or sad based on what is happening. That word happy comes from happen, I think. You know. And in the kingdom, it's, it's not based on that. It's based on what's already been done. What's already been done. A servant king, a despised king, a rejected king, a suffering king, a crucified king that does not fit our proud, self-centered, and carnal expectations any more than it did when he came the first time. They want him to take over and, and be a physical, a natural, carnal king. and That's not who he is right now. This is the reason why we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds in Romans 12 too. We subconsciously continue that vicious cycle of looking for a physical conquering king to wipe out all of our difficulties, to wipe out all of our earthly problems. That's what we look for. That's what we pray about. That's what we seek. That's the songs we sing and the messages we get taught. Our natural conception of the Messiah's king are rooted only in the natural and physical, and we have to be aware of this if if it's going to change, you got to know this about yourself. If it's going to change, Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. John 18, 36, my Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. The kingdom, the authority or rule of God is spiritual, especially in this present age. And, and it will appear in its final perfected form in the eternity, as I alluded to earlier, new heaven and new earth. Because when our king comes again, when he comes back, the whole world is going to see the power and the glory of our present spiritual and eternal kingdom. They're going to see it. We see it, but the whole world is going to see it. But until then, 
Until then, we can offer up a sacrifice of praise to our king. Colossians 1, 13, 14, Ephesians 1, 3. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. May blessing be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. True peace, true joy is a byproduct of living in his presence, of staying connected to the king. And if you will make problem solving secondary, if you will just put that aside, put your problem solving skills aside, make them secondary to the goal of staying connected and staying before the throne by offering your sacrifice of praise, then you will find joy no matter what the circumstance is. And I mean that most sincerely. No matter what the circumstance is, you will find peace and you will find joy. Jesus is your king. Speak that. Sing it. Shout it. Whisper it. Jesus is your king. Amen. 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 <laughs> Revelation 19, 16. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed. King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Amen.